So one huge area of applied behavior analysis is in training animals, be it for pet training or in zoos or to do specialized tasks like in the Navy's marine mammal program where dolphins and sea lions, they, they've been trained to do things like finding, um, protecting people from mines or clearing those. Um, people in Hollywood train animals for movies, stuff like that. If you look into professional animal training at all, you will quickly run into, you know, applied behavior analysts working, often people who are BCBAs will work in the field. And you'll also run into a term a lot that's called clicker training. So I wanted to explain that in this video, kind of where that comes from. But that means first we have to understand something called conditioned reinforcers. So some things are naturally reinforcing. Like they naturally work to increase the probability of whatever behavior they follow. We call those unconditioned reinforcers. This is literally just another word for like a US in Pavlovian conditioning, an unconditioned stimulus. But here the type of stimulus is a reinforcing stimulus, right? An S with a little R above it. But when we say unconditioned reinforcer, we mean that's innate to the species. It doesn't require any learning history for this thing to be reinforcing for that individual or that species. For example, food and water can be, right? If you're hungry, then whatever behavior leads to you getting a food reinforcer, you're going to do that behavior again in the future when you're hungry. Similarly, if you're thirsty, whatever you did, that whatever behaviors got water in your mouth, you're more likely to do those behaviors again in the future. Water acted as a reinforcer when you're thirsty. Same can be, you know, sex can be a reinforcer, play, touch or petting, depending on the species. These are common ones with a lot of mammal species, for example. The downsides of using an unconditioned reinforcer as your reinforcement during training is that it can quickly lose effectiveness due to satiation, like getting too full. Um, so for example, if we use sex as a reinforcer, rewarding a male rat for lever pressing by giving it a mating opportunity with a receptive female, this is sometimes done in studies, that will indeed reinforce lever pressing behavior. But then there's quite a delay before you can do it. Another trial, right? There's a, there's a delay in there. They satiate quickly, unless you take advantage of the Coolidge effect. Um, likewise, using food too much during training can lead to unhealthy weight. So we might want, not want to do that. Like sometimes food reinforcers have a big trade-off in the long run. And depending on the, the unconditioned reinforcer, it may just be hard to deliver it instantly after a behavior. Like even with food, it takes a moment to get a treat out and deliver it. And that delay makes it a little less effective than if we had a way to make it instantaneous. So that said, obviously we do use unconditioned reinforcers all the time. I'm sure you've used it to train a pet like a dog or a cat. Um, I'll give you an example here in this video. You'll see how they've trained uh, Siamang. So uh, a lesser ape in a zoo, she's, she's been trained to extend her arm so that the vet can do a blood draw. So let me show you the example. Get some food. So you can see food being used as an unconditioned reinforcer here to get desired behaviors. And training this calm behavior is way more humane and safe and less stressful for zoo animals than trying to like restrain her forcefully in order to do the blood draw. Right? Like wild animals will naturally pull back from the pain of something like this, but through training using an unconditioned reinforcer like food, you can get them to do behaviors they wouldn't normally do, right? You have to shape this, but eventually this is a great way to make sure that this zoo animal, if you're going to have animals trapped in a zoo, that this is a way to make it safer and more healthy and less stressful for them when you have to do medical procedures to keep them healthy. Um, however, other things can become reinforcing that weren't naturally reinforcing before. So we can create reinforcers out of things that weren't reinforcers before. We call those conditioned reinforcers. So this is basically just a CS in Pavlovian conditioning, right? Going back to respondent conditioning, this is basically just a CS, but the S here is a reinforcing stimulus that we're interested in. So we call these conditioned reinforcers. These are learned reinforcers. They, they, weren't reinforcing until they were associated with some unconditioned reinforcer. Basically, these are things we connect to food and water and sex and touch and play and all those naturally rewarding things. For example, 
the words good dog, right? That's a, that's a very arbitrary set of phonemes. It depends on the language, right? It's, a, it's just random noises to a dog initially, but the words good dog or for humans, the pieces of paper that we call money or the sound of the food dispenser in an operant chamber, right? Just the mechanical clicks and whirs that mean food is about to show up. All those types of things can come eventually to be reinforcing all on their own because they get paired with things that we naturally find reinforcing. Now, some downsides of using a conditioned reinforcer, though, if that's your way of reinforcing a behavior, is that it's going to be susceptible to extinction if it's not occasionally paired with the unconditioned reinforcer. Basically, if dollar dollar bills didn't actually lead to us getting enjoyable things like food, right? if you're not using it to buy food and stuff like that, then we'll stop finding dollars reinforcing. They have to at least occasionally be connected to the, to the original, the primary, the unconditioned reinforcers. Uh, if for your dog, the if the phonemic sounds of good dog didn't get paired up with attention or petting, the dog would eventually stop giving a crap about that phrase. It wouldn't actually reinforce the dog anymore if it's not at least occasionally paired up with getting the dog attention or petting. Now, one trick that's often used in animal training and, and actually other contexts as well, but most famously in animal training, is using a clicker. There's a cheap little device, you can get them really cheap on, on Amazon, you can get them in bulk. With clicker training, we're basically turning a little popping sound that comes from a little handheld clicker into a conditioned reinforcer by repeatedly pairing it with an unconditioned reinforcer like food. So this is totally respondent conditioning, just like Pavlov. It starts as a neutral stimulus, but because it always shows up right before an unconditioned stimulus, an unconditioned reinforcer, it's going to eventually become a CS. It's going to become a conditioned reinforcing stimulus in this case. Now, the benefit and power of this cheap, simple little technology is that clicks can be delivered faster than food and other things, right? They can happen immediately after the behavior. And once the clicker itself has come to be rewarding, it's great because the clicker sound doesn't cause satiation the way that they might get full from food or treats, right? And once the clicker sound itself becomes reinforcing, it can be used to increase any target behaviors. It basically becomes something the individual likes and will work for in a more basic way. Um, so I'll show you a video example of this with a dog trainer. When your dog has made the association between the sound and reward, you can then begin to teach him different action cues using the clicker. I'm waiting for him to put his bottom on the ground. And when he does, he's going to get the treat. As soon as he puts his bottom on the ground, I click and I treat him. So not only, not only is she training a, a sit behavior, but she's doing respondent conditioning to make that clicker itself a reinforcer. That click sound happens before the treat goes in his mouth, so he's going to start liking the click sound as well. One way this might look in, in practice is like maybe first you're giving a verbal command, which is discriminative stimulus, right? The, the thing we want to set the occasion for sitting behavior. So you verbalize sit. And the rule is, the contingency is, if the dog sits, you give it food, right? Then you give the command, and now as soon as the dog does the sitting behavior, you, you click and then give the food. You can, you can do it kind of like she did in the last video. You could just skip to this step here with the, the clicker. At any rate, then you start making the food intermittent, so it's sometimes they get food, right? While still keeping the clicker consistent. We know that intermittent reinforcement is resistant to extinction later due to the partial reinforcement effect. Then we might make the, the food, the unconditioned reinforcer, even more rare, right? At this point, the clicker itself may be reinforcer that, that's maintaining the sitting behavior, and the food rarely has to show up. At that point, the clicker has started acting as an SR, right? As a, as a stimulus that's reinforcing, a conditioned reinforcing stimulus all on its own. At that point, we could use it to train other behaviors. So we could use a different verbal prompt like shake and use the clicker to do shaping and to reinforce shaking hands behavior so that it becomes more probable when the verbal shake SD happens. Likewise, if we want to train the dog to bark, we could give a speak command and the clicker could now be used as a conditioned reinforcer to make that happen. 
So once it's become a condition reinforcer, you can use it like any other reinforcer. Although again, you want to go back once in a while and pair it up with an unconditioned reinforcer. So it keeps its power, but you can do that intermittently and that'll actually resist extinction, make it last a long time. So a nice thing about clickers is that when we're doing shaping to try to get an animal closer to the intended behavior, a clicker can be used as a sort of weaker reinforcer when they aren't quite doing the target behavior, but maybe when they're getting warmer, they're getting closer, then they get the food when they do the fully intended behavior. Now this only works if you've already trained the clicker into a reinforcer, right? A conditioned reinforcer. But here's an example with a zookeeper training a, a tamarin to approach and, and touch a little target, a little ball on the end of a stick. You're going to hear her use the clicker as a sort of encouragement, sort of, kind of like saying, warmer, warmer, keep going, almost there. You can see it also took her a moment to get the food out of her pocket, so it's nice that she's able to click right when he does the proper behavior and signal this is what means you did it, you're gonna get the food. In essence, a, a clicker can work really basically as an event marker. By happening right at the instant of the desired behavior, it communicates clearly this is what's being reinforced. Think of it this way. Imagine you're using food to reward a dog for a trick like sit, right? If it takes you five full seconds to go grab a piece of food after they sit, and then throw it to the dog after it does the behavior, then the dog might not associate the food with it sitting, right? It might associate it with whatever it did in the five seconds since then. Maybe it sat and then scratched its side a little bit and then the food shows up, okay? Its brain might associate side scratching with reinforcement. Or maybe it sat and then licked its balls for a second and then the food showed up, okay? Its brain might associate ball licking with reinforcement. That delay can really slow down learning. So what we want to do is have some reinforcement that can occur immediately after the behavior to maximize how quickly and how easily the association is made between the individual's behavior and the reinforcing consequence. That's the, the benefit here. By the way, some evidence suggests a clicker is more efficient at training a new behavior than developing like a verbal reinforcer, like saying good. Uh, in fact, around 33% less training time to get the same performance in, in one study that I saw. Now, if you want, later the clicker can be replaced by a, a verbal event marker like yes or good or whatever. And it may, be, may even be beneficial to provide a variety of reinforcement, like some condition reinforcers, some unconditioned, combination, clicker, verbal, whatever, to kind of keep the behavior happening consistently over time. So with a dog, you may not have to give food once the behavior is trained. You don't have to do it every time, right? Um, if, especially if like attention itself becomes um, a reinforcer, like, so, so if, a, if the dog is attention motivated, human motivated, then maybe attention can serve as an unconditioned reinforcer for the dog, in which case you never have to use food for the training after that, just getting attention might be enough. If it's not though, then maybe you've got to throw in some actual unconditioned reinforcers like food once in a while to be paired with the conditioned reinforcers like your verbal commands or your clicker, just to avoid extinction eventually happening to, to extinguish the power of the conditioned reinforcer. So now let's take a break for a minute and, and see a couple of really cool real world applications where applied behavior analysts have used clicker training to get animals to do some really impressive things. I'm here today to share with you an extraordinary journey extraordinarily rewarding journey, actually, which brought me into training rats to save human lives by detecting landmines and tuberculosis. As a child, I had two passions. One was a passion for rodents. I had all kinds of rats, mice, hamsters, gerbils, squirrels, you name it, I bred it and I sold them to pet shops. I also had a passion for Africa. Growing up in a multicultural environment, we had African students in the house and I learned about their stories. So different background, dependency on imported know-how, 
goods, services, exuberant cultural diversity, Africa was truly fascinating for me. I became an industrial engineer, engineer in product development, and I focused on appropriate detection technologies. Actually, first, appropriate technologies for developing countries. I started working in the industry, but I wasn't really happy to contribute to a material consumer society in a linear extracting and manufacturing mode. I quit my job to focus on a real-world problem, landmines. We're talking 95 now. Princess Diana is announcing on TV that landmines form a structural barrier to any development, which is really true. As long as these devices are there or there is suspicion of landmines, you can't really enter into the land. Actually, there was an appeal worldwide for new detectors, sustainable in the environment where they needed to produce, which is mainly in the developing world. We chose rats. Why would you choose rats? Because aren't they vernim? Well, actually, rats are, in contrary to what most people think about them, rats are highly sociable creatures, and actually our product, what you see here. There's a target somewhere here. Uh, you see an operator, a trained African, with his rats in front, who actually left and right. There the animal finds a mine, it scratches on the soil, and the animal comes back for a food reward. Very, very simple, very sustainable in this environment. Here the animal gets its food reward, and that's how it works. Very, very simple. Now, why would you use rats? Rats have been used since the 50s last century in all kinds of experiments. Rats have more genetic material allocated to olfaction than any other mammal species. They're extremely sensitive to smell. Moreover, they have the mechanisms to map all these smells and to communicate about it. Now, how do we communicate with rats? Well, uh, we, we don't talk rats, but we have a clicker, a uh, standard method for animal training, uh, which you see there. A clicker, which makes a particular sound, with which we can reinforce particular behaviors. First of all, we associate the click sound with the food reward, which is mashed banana and peanuts together in a syringe. Once the animal knows click, food, click, food, click, food, so click is food, we bring it in a cage with a hole, and actually the animal learns to stick the nose in the hole under which a target scent is placed, and to do that for five seconds. Five seconds, which is long for a rat. Once the animal knows this, we make the task a bit more difficult. It learns now to find the target smell in a cage with several holes, up to ten holes. Then the animal learns to walk on a leash in the open and find targets. In the next step, animals learn to find real mines in real minefields. They are tested and accredited uh, according to international mine action standards, just like dogs have to pass a test. This consists of 400 square meters. There's a number of mines, a number of mines uh, placed blindly, and a team of trainer and their rat have to find back all the, uh, all the targets. If the animal does that, it gets a license as an accredited animal to be operational in the field. Just like dogs, by the way. Maybe one slight difference. We can train rats at a fifth of the price of a trained demining dog. This is our team in Mozambique. One Tanzanian trainer who transfers the skills to these three Mozambican fellows. And you should see the pride in the eyes of these people. They have a skill which makes them much less dependent on uh, foreign aid. Moreover, this small team, together with, of course, you need the heavy vehicles and the manual deminers to follow up, but with this small investment in a rat capacity, we have demonstrated in Mozambique that we can reduce the cost price per square meter up to 60% of what is currently normal. $2 per square meter, we do it at 1.18, and we can still bring that price down. Question of scale, if we can bring in more rats, we can actually make the output even bigger. We have a demonstration site in Mozambique. Eleven African governments have seen that they can become less dependent by using this technology. They have signed a pact for peace and treaty in the Great Lakes region, and um, they endorse hero rats uh, to clear 
their common borders of landmines. But let me bring you to a very different problem, and there's about 6,000 people last year that walked on a landmine. But worldwide, last year almost 1.9 million died from tuberculosis as a first cause of infection. Especially in Africa, where TB and HIV are strongly linked, there is a huge uh, common problem. Microscopy, the standard WHO procedure, reaches some 40 to 60 percent reliability. Uh, in Tanzania, the numbers don't lie, 45 percent of people get di TB patients get diagnosed with TB before they die. That means that if you have TB, you have more chance that you won't be detected but will just die from TB, secondary infections and so on. And um, if, however, you're detected very early, diagnosed early, treatment can start, and even in HIV positives, it makes sense, you can actually cure TB even in HIV positives. So, in our common language, Dutch, the name for TB is terin, which etymologically refers to the smell of tar. Already the old Chinese and the Greek, Hippocrates, have actually published, documented, that TB can be diagnosed based on the volatiles exuding from uh, patients. So what we did is we collected some samples, just as a way of testing, from hospitals, uh, trained rats on them, uh, and, well, see, see if this works, and wonder, well, we can reach 89% sensitivity, 86% specificity using uh, multiple rats in a row. This is how it works. And really, this is a generic technology. We're talking now explosive, tuberculosis, but can you imagine you can actually put anything under there? So, how does it work? You have a cassette with 10 samples. We put these 10 samples at once in the cage. An animal only needs two hundredths of a second to discriminate the scent, so it goes extremely fast. Here it's already at the third sample. This is a positive sample. Uh, gets a click sound and comes for a full reward. And by doing so, very fast, we can have like a second line opinion uh, where to see which patients are positive, which are negative. Just as an indication, whereas a microscopist can process 40 samples in a day, a rat can process the same amount of samples in seven minutes only. A cage like this A cage like this, provided that you have rats, and we have now currently 25 uh, tuberculosis rats, uh, a cage like this, operating throughout the day, can process 1,680 samples. Can you imagine the potential offspring applications? Environmental detection of pollutants in soils, uh, the customs applications, detection of illicit goods in containers, and so on. But let's stick first to tuberculosis. I, I just want to briefly highlight the blue rods are the scores of microscopy only in the five clinics in Dar es Salaam on a population of 500,000 people where 15,000 reported to get a test done. Microscopy found 1,800 patients and by just presenting those samples once more to the rats and looping those results back, we were able to increase case detection rates by over 30%. Throughout last year, we've been, uh, depending on which intervals you take, we've been consistently increasing case detection rates in five hospitals in Dar es Salaam between 30 and 40 percent. So this is really considerable. Knowing that a missed patient by microscopy infects up to 15 people, healthy people per year, uh, you can be sure that uh, we have saved lots of lives. At least our hero rats have saved lots of lives. The way forward for us is now to standardize this technology. And there are simple things, like for instance, we have a small laser in the sniffer hole where the animal has to stick for five seconds, so to standardize this, also to standardize the pellets, the food rewards, and to semi-automate this in order to replicate this on a much larger scale and affect lives of many more people. 
To conclude, there are also other applications at the horizon. Here is the first prototype of uh, our camera rat, which is a, a rat with a rat backpack with a camera that can go under rubble to detect for victims after earthquake and so on. This is in a prototype stage. We don't have a working system here yet. <laughs> to conclude, I would actually like to say, you may think this is about rats, this project, but in the end it is about people. It is about empowering vulnerable communities to tackle difficult, expensive and dangerous humanitarian detection tasks and doing that with a local resource plenty available. So something completely different is to keep on challenging your perception about the resources surrounding you, whether they are environmental, technological, animal or human. And to respectfully harmonize with them in order to foster a sustainable world. Thank you very much. So I just think that's a pretty cool example of using applied behavior analysis to solve real world tasks that help people. And you can hear like throughout that they were using clickers as part of the training clickers as, as a conditioned reinforcer to like train their rats or to once they're trained to, to um, give them a, a basically like you're about to get the food reward. You did the right thing to like give them an immediate reinforcer to signal like, OK, now you can go over to the edge here and get your food reward. Uh, now, I just wanted to mention one side note before we finish this video, which is the topic of drug dogs like used by police. These are dogs trained to pick up the smell of, of like various illegal drugs because dogs do have sensitive noses. They can pick up smaller amounts of odorant than a human nose. However, their performance is not perfect, even in ideally controlled laboratory conditions, although in, in ideally controlled lab conditions, it is pretty good. And when police use them out in the real world, it's way, way, way worse. Most of the time, when a drug dog signals on a car, there ends up not being drugs in the car. Yet the dog signal, or its handler saying that it signaled, is considered enough legally for probable cause to search a vehicle. But scientific studies and like investigations by reporters have shown that drug dogs are highly biased by their handler's behavior, leading them to give off lots of false alarms, likely on the people the officer happens to be suspicious of. And this can exacerbate like racial profiling like this can. Um, for example, there's a three year investigation in Chicago that showed Hispanic drivers um, on whom a drug dog signaled ended up ha only having actual drugs in the car 27% of the time. So most of the time it was a false alarm compared to only 44% of the time overall, which again is still mostly false alarms, mostly innocent people, but it's worse for some than others. So a ton of innocent people suffer through searches where their car may be taken apart a long time. It's actually a half hour on average, which can be invasive, frightening and humiliating. And, and in fact, in that same state in 2013, a study found that drug dogs were wrong as often as they were right. And black and Hispanic motorists were more likely to be dog searched than white motorists, even though white motorists were more likely to actually have drugs. Unfortunately, most states have no statutes to ensure drug dogs are well trained or to test their accuracy in any way. And even the professional trainers who do this for a living acknowledge that handlers often use like suspect methods and are lazy about their training. So the dogs may signal simply because the handler leads them around a car a couple extra times or based on something else in the officer behavior, just like the famous horse Clever Hans that appeared able to solve math problems by stamping its feet, but turned out just to be reacting to its owner's subtle and unintended cues. In fact, one uh, controlled scientific study looked at various breeds and different environments and found that drug dogs, they were correct only about 60% of the time in car searches, even in this controlled uh, lab type setting. And other research has shown pretty conclusively that handlers affect their drug dog's behavior. They actually brought in professional dogs with their professional handlers and they ran them through four conditions. So the handlers were told two of the conditions would have paper marking where the scent location was, although this was a trick. The paper marker was there, but literally no drug scent was used in this entire study. There was never any drug here, but the handler thought there was in two of the conditions. 
what the researchers did do was put some decoy scents out in a couple of the conditions. They'd put a scent that's like a food or a toy, right? Decoys, but no contraband, just to see if that would cause false alarms. And then they're also seeing if the human element of their owner's beliefs would cause false alarms. So the the real conditions that they used in this study, they had four conditions. There was a total control condition with nothing, just like the dog, see how much they randomly give their response when there's no drugs. Then there's a paper marker. So the human thinks there's, you know, scents in certain places, but there's no decoy scent. There's no scent at all. There's nothing here. Um, or a condition with a paper marker combined with a decoy scent. So food or whatever. Uh, and then, you know, a decoy scent alone was also a condition. So no paper marker. There's nothing about the owner's belief, but something like a food scent left for the dog. Then what they did is they measured in each of those four conditions how many false alerts the dog gave. And remember, anytime the dog gives its, I found something response, it is a false alert in this study because there's literally no drugs. There's no contraband here. And what happened? The dogs made more mistakes in the paper marker condition where their handler falsely thought there was real contraband. In fact, this was a bigger factor in false alarms than the decoy scent of food or a toy. These well-trained dogs weren't generally giving false alarms on, oh, I smelled food or a toy or whatever, just because they're excited, but they were giving a lot of false alarms when their owner wanted them to, when their owner thought there might be some drugs there. Unfortunately, this science is not taken into account when it comes to court cases. So the Supreme Court heard a case in 2005 where they decided that a dog sniff during a traffic stop without any probable cause at all doesn't count as an unreasonable search under the Fourth Amendment because, as Justice Stevens explained it, it reveals no information other than the location of a substance that no individual has any right to possess. End quote. The majority opinion, the one made into precedent by the Supreme Court, literally assumed that dogs only give an alert when a drug is genuinely present, which we know isn't true at all. Drug dogs are about as accurate as a freaking coin flip, and flipping a coin would be a lot cheaper. In 2013, the Supreme Court again heard a case about drug dogs, and they decided in that case that a dog has to be certified in some way. There's no qualifications about what counts as certification. Nothing qualifies that at all. They can, they can simply assume, if a dog's certified, they can simply assume it's accurate and reliable and thus, by itself, can provide po probable cause. That is how the Supreme Court has ruled this. In fact, in a 2015 case, um, the, the case came to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. So not the Supreme Court, a lower circuit federal court of appeals. Um, where they used this precedent. So in that case, the dog had alerted, there was a, a drug dog working for a police officer that had al alerted in 93 out of 100 times. 93% of the time it alerted. And the handler admitted he was only rewarding the dog when it alerted. He literally was just reinforcing it for any alert so that it could confirm the person's hunches, right? But the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals based on the Supreme Court stuff from before, they upheld this guy's searches because of the Supreme Court decision that a certified dog is presumed to be accurate. And this guy's dog had been certified at one point, even though he wasn't actually doing things right. He was cheating. Uh, ditto for a case with a drug dog that was wrong 60% of the time. Same thing when it hit the courts. So those Supreme Court things have trickled down and are used as precedent for all sorts of court cases now. This stuff is important because there's no doubt that dogs have a great olfactory system. And yes, in controlled conditions, they often can detect things pretty well. But when a person using a dog is allowed to bias its behavior, we're no longer getting an, an accurate measure of the dog's nose in any objective sense. Anyway, we'll stop here for the animal trading side of applied behavior analysis.